Suggested answers to the 2018 bar examinations in civil law. Question. Sidley and Saul were married with one daughter, Solene. Said Frey and Sonia were another couple with one son, Sunny. Saul and said Frey both perished in the same plane accident. Sedley and Sonia met when the families of those who died sued the airlines and went through grief counseling sessions. Years later, Sedley and Sonia got married. At that time, Solene was four years old and Sunny was five years old. These two were then brought up in the same household. Fifteen years later, Solene and Sunny developed romantic feelings towards each other and eventually eloped. On their own and against their parents' wishes, they procured a marriage license and got married in church. Letter A. Is the answer... Is the marriage of Solene and Sunny valid, voidable, or void? Suggested answer. The marriage is voidable for lack of parental consent. At the time their, of their marriage, Solene and Sunny were only 19 and 20 years old, respectively. Assuming their marriage is under the family code, Article 14 provides that parental consent is required where either or both of the parties are between 18 and 21 years old at the time of marriage. In the absence of such parental consent, Article 45 of the Family Code provides that the marriage is voidable. Since the marriage was against their parents' wishes, their marriage is voidable. Unlike in the Civil Code, their being step-siblings is immaterial under the Family Code and will not render the marriage void since such is not considered in was under nor against public policy. Letter B. If the marriage is defective, can the marriage be ratified by free cohabitation of the parties? Suggested answer. Yes, it can be ratified by free cohabitation. Article 45.1 of the Family Code provides that such voidable marriage may be ratified by free cohabitation of the parties over 18 years old but below 21 who married without the consent of his or her parents by living together as husband and wife after attaining the age of 21. Here, Sulen and Sunny freely cohabitated and lived as husband and wife after attaining 21 years. Then the marriage is considered ratified provided that the parents have not filed an action for annulment before the parties reach 21 years old. Number 2. After finding out that his girlfriend Sandy was four months pregnant, Sancho married Sandy. Both were single and had never been in any serious relationship in the past. Prior to the marriage, they agreed in a marriage settlement that the regime of conjugal partnership of gains shall govern their property relations during marriage. Shortly after the marriage, their daughter Shalimar was born. Before they met and got married, Sancho purchased a parcel of land on installment under a contract of sale with the full purchase price payable in equal annual amortization over a period of 10 years with no down payment and secured by a mortgage on the land. The full purchase price was 1 million pesos with interest at the rate of 6% per annum. After paying the fourth annual installment, Sancho and Sandy got married and Sancho completed the payments in the subsequent years from his salary as an accountant. The previous payments were also paid out of his salary. During their marriage, Sandy also won 1 million pesos in the lottery and used it to purchase jewelry. When things didn't work out for the couple, they filed an action for declaration of nullity of their marriage based on the psychological incapacity of both of them. When the petition was granted, the parcel of land and the jewelry bought by Sandy were found to be the only properties of the couple. Letter A. What is the filiation status of Shalimar? Suggested answer. Shalimar is a legitimate child. Children conceived or born before the judgment of absolute nullity of the marriage because of psychological incapacity under Article 36 has become final and executory shall be considered legitimate, Article 54 Family Code. Since Shalimar was born before the judgment granting the petition for declaration of absolute nullity of marriage of Sancho and Sandy under Article 36 became final and executory, Shalimar is a legitimate child. Letter B. What system of property relationship will be liquidated following the declaration of nullity of their marriage? 
suggested answer. The property regime shall be liquidated is co-ownership under Article 147 of the Family Code. When a man and a woman who are capacitated to marry each other live exclusively with each other as husband and wife under a void marriage, their wages and salaries shall be owned by them in equal shares and the property acquired by both of them through their work or industry shall be governed by the rules on co-ownership. Article 147 Family Code Sancho and Sande were capacitated to marry each other. However, their marriage was declared void under Article 36. Letter C In the liquidation, who should get the parcel of land? The jewelry. Suggested answer. Sancho would get the parcel of land while Sandy should get the jewelry. According to Article 147 of the Family Code, property acquired through their work or industry by a man and a woman who are capacitated to marry each other and who cohabited under a void marriage shall be governed by rules on co-ownership and in the absence of proof to the contrary, properties acquired while they live together shall be presumed to have been obtained by their joint efforts, work, or industry. In the given case, Sancho bought the parcel of land and paid for it using his salary while Sandy used her winnings from the lottery to purchase the jewelry. It was not established that Sandy cared for or maintained the family. Hence, she should not be deemed to have contributed to the acquisition of the parcel of land. The jewelry was acquired by Sandy using her lottery winnings, which she obtained not by work or industry, but by chance. Letter D. Is Shalimar entitled to payment of presumptive legitim? If yes, how much should be her share and from where should this be taken? Suggested answer. No, Shalimar is not entitled to presumptive legitim. The liquidation of the co-ownership under Article 147 did not provide for the obligation to pay the presumptive legitim of the common children. Said obligation applies only to the liquidation of the absolute community or conjugal partnership of gains during pursuant to Article 50 and 51 of the Family Code, which provisions are inapplicable to avoid marriage under Article 36 of the Family Code. The rules on co-ownership apply and the properties of the parties should be liquidated in accordance with the Civil Code provisions on co-ownership. Dino v. Dino, 640 Escra 178-2011, Valdez v. RTC, 260 Escra 221-1996. Question. Silvirio was a woman trapped in a man's body. He was born male and his birth certificate indicated his gender as male and his name as Silvirio Estalon. When he reached the age of 21, he had his sex reassignment, surgery in Bangkok, and from then on, he lived as a female. On the basis of his sex reassignment, he filed an action to have his first name changed to Shelley and his ge gender to female. While he was following up his case with the regional trial court, Of Manila, he met Sharon Stone, who also filed a similar action to change her first name to Sharif and her gender from female to male. Sharon was registered as a female upon birth. While growing up, she developed male characteristics and was diagnosed to have congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a condition where a person possesses both male and female characteristics. At puberty, tests revealed that her ovarian structures had greatly minimized and she had no breast or menstrual development, alleging that for all intents and appearances as well as mind and emotion, she had become a male. She prayed that her birth certificate be corrected such that her gender should be changed from female to male and that her first name should be changed from Sharon to Sharif. Silvirio and Sharon fell in love and decided to marry. Realizing that their marriage will be frowned upon in the Philippines, they traveled to Las Vegas, USA, where they got married based on the law of the place of celebration of the marriage. They, however, kept their Philippine citizenship. Is there any legal basis for the court 
to approve Silverio's petition for correction of entries in his birth certificate. Suggested answer, no, there is no legal basis for the court to approve Silverio's petition. As settled in the case of Silverio v. Republic, GR No. 174689, October 22, 2007, our laws do not sanction change of name and correction of entry in the civil registry as to sex on the ground of sex reassignment. Sex reassignment is not one of the grounds for which change of first name may be allowed under Republic Act Number no. 9048. The petition for correction of entry as to sex of, birth, of the birth certificate of Silverio cannot prosper because the said document contained no error and cannot be corrected. Silverio was born a male. The sex of a person is determined at birth. Considering that there is no law legally recognizing sex reassignment, the determination of a person's sex made at the time of his or her birth, if not attended by error, is immutable. Will your answer be the same in the case of Sharon's petition? Suggested answer. No, my answer will not be the same. In the case of Republic v. Kagandahan, GR 166676, September 12, 2008, the Supreme Court held that where the person is biologically or naturally intersex, the determining factor is his gender classification should be what the individual having reached the age of majority with good reason thinks of his or her sex. Sharon is considered an intersex because he has CAH, which means that she has the biological characteristics of both male and female. Based on that case, Sharon's petition should be granted since he has simply let nature take its course and has not taken unnatural steps to arrest or interfere with what he was born with. The change of name should also be granted considering that it merely recognizes Sharon's preferred gender. Letter C. Can the marriage of Silverio, Shelley, and Sharon, Sharif, be legally recognized as valid in the Philippines? Suggested answer. No, it cannot be legally recognized as valid. Laws relating to the status, condition, and legal capacity of person are binding upon citizens of the Philippines even though living abroad. Article 15, Civil Code. One of the requisites of a marriage is that the contracting parties must be a male and a female. Article 2, Family Code. Since Silverio and Sharon are Filipino citizens, their status, condition, and legal capacity is determined by Philippine law. Their marriage abroad is not a valid marriage under Philippine law because both contracting parties are males. Alternative answer. Yes, the marriage can be legally recognized in the Philippines. Since Silverio is male and Sharon is also male, they cannot be legally married in the Philippines. However, they got married in a place outside the Philippines where same-sex marriages are allowed. Under Article 26 of the Family Code, marriages solemnized outside the Philippines and considered valid there should also be considered valid here, except for specific conditions. Being of the same gender is not one of the exceptions, so the marriage should be considered valid. Another alternative answer, yes, if Silveria and Sharon used their original birth certificates, one showing that one is registered male and the one showing that the other is registered female, then the marriage may be a valid marriage under Philippine law. Question, Severino died in this state survived by his wife Saturnina and legitimate children Soler, Sulpicio, Segundo, and the twins Sandro and Sandra. At the time of his death, the twins were only 11 years of age, while all the other children were of age. He left only one property, a 5,000 square meter parcel of land. After his death, the older siblings Soler, Sulpicio, and Segundo sold the land to Dr. Santos for 500,000 pesos with a right to repurchase at the same price within five years from the date of the sale. The deed of sale was signed only by the three older siblings and covered the entire property. Before the five years expired, Soler and Sulpicio tendered their respective shares of 166,666 pesos each to redeem the property. 
Si, since Segundo did not have the means because he was still unemployed, Saturnina paid the remaining 166,666 pesos to redeem the property. After the property was redeemed from Dr. Santos, the three older children and Saturnina for herself and on behalf of the twins who were still minors, sold the property to Dr. Sasson in an absolute sale for 1 million pesos. In representing the twins, Saturnina relied on the fact that she was the natural guardian of her minor children. Letter A. Was the first sale to Dr. Santos and the subsequent repurchase valid? Suggested answer. Yes, the sale is valid but only with respect to the shares pertaining to Soler, Sulpicio, and Segundo. Upon Severino's death, his heirs became the co-owners of the only property he left since the rights to the succession are transmitted from the moment of the death of the decedent. Article 777 Civil Code of the Philippines. In a co-ownership, each co-owner may alienate his part, but the effect of the alienation with respect to the co-owner shall be limited to the portion which may be allotted to the co-owner who alienated his share. Article 493 Civil Code The repurchase by Soler and Sulpicio was valid up to their respective shares. The repurchase of Segundo's share did not make Saturnina the owner of the share redeemed, although she is entitled to reimbursement. Letter B. Was the second sale to Dr. Sasson valid? May the twins redeem their share after they reach the age of majority? Suggested answer. The second sale was valid only as to the aliquot shares of Saturnina and of the three older siblings. Under Article 225 of the Family Code, the father and the mother shall jointly exercise legal guardianship over the property of the unemancipated common child without the necessity of a court appointment. This guardianship, however, only extends to powers of administration over the property of the child and does not include the power to alienate, which is an act of strict dominion. Saturnina had no authority to sell the twins' property and the sale to the extent of the unenforceable. Uh, since it is already unenforceable, the twins do not need to redeem the property upon reaching the age of majority. Alternative answer. The second sale is valid as to Saturnina and the other siblings, but as to the twins, the sale is invalid and the twins are allowed to recover or demand the reconveyance of their share in the property. Question. Sol Sol Divino, widow, passed away leaving two legitimate children, a 25-year-old son, Santino, whom she had not spoken to for five years prior to her death since he attempted to kill her at that time, and the 20-year-old daughter, Sarah. She left an estate worth 8 million pesos and a will which contained only one provision that 1 million pesos should be given to the priest who officiated at my wedding to my children's late father. Sarah, together with two of her friends, acted as an attesting witness to the will. On the assumption that the will is admitted for probate and that there are no debts, divide the estate and indicated the heirs' legatees entitled to inherit the amount that each of them will inherit and where, example, legitim, free, portion, intestate share, their share should be charged. Suggested answer. Santino and Sara are entitled to 3.5 million pesos each while the priest who officiated at the wedding of Saul to her children's father is entitled to receive 1 million peso as legacy from the free portion of the Saul's estate. 2 million out of the 3.5 million comes from their legitim, while the remaining 1.5 million is from the free portion. Santino is not disqualified to inherit from her mother because an attempt against the life of the decedent is a cause for unworthiness of an heir only if there is a final judgment of conviction. Article 
10332 Civil Code. The given facts do not mention that Santino was convicted of an attempt against the life of Saul. Sarah is also capacitated to inherit from Saul. The statement found in Article 1027 of the Civil Code that an attesting witness to the execution of a will shall be incapable of succeeding is disqualified by Article 823 Civil Code, which provides that the device or legacy in favor of a person who is an attesting witness to the execution of the will shall be void. Sarah is not a device or legacy under Saul's will. She is an intestate and compulsory heir. The priest is also capable of succeeding as a legacy because under Article 1027, Civil Code, only the priest who heard the confession of the testator during his last illness and his relatives within the fourth degree that and the church to which he belongs are disqualified from inheriting from the decedent by will. The priest only officiated the wedding of the decedent. Question. Sami and Santi are cousins who separately inherited two adjoining lots from their grandfather. Sami is based overseas but wants to earn income from his inherited land. So he asked a local contractor to build a row of apartments on his property which he could rent out. The contractor sent him the plans and Sami noticed that the construction encroached on a part of Santi's land but he said nothing and gave approval to, the const to construct based on the plans submitted by the local contractor. Santi, based locally and who loved his cousin dearly, did not object even if he knew of the encroachment since he was private to the plants and visited the property regularly. Later, the cousin suddenly falling out and Santi dem demanded that the portion of the apartments that encroaches on his land be demolished. Can Santi su successfully file legal action to require the demolition? Suggested answer. No, Santi cannot successfully file a legal action to require the demolition. Since the builder and the landowner both acted in bad faith, the right shall be the same as though both had acted in good faith. Article 453 Civil Code. Sami is not a builder in good faith with respect to the portion of the apartment encroached on Santi's property because he knew that he was not the owner of the land when he built the apartment. There is bad faith likewise on Santi's part because he did not object to the construction although he had knowledge thereof. Article 453 Civil Code in cases where both the landowner and the builder acted in good faith, the landowner does not have the option to demand the demolition of the work. Article 448 Civil Code Question Sydney, during her lifetime, was a successful lawyer. By her own choice, she remained unmarried and devoted all her time to taking care of her nephew and two nieces, Socrates, Safinia, and Sophia. She wrote a will giving all her properties remaining upon her death to the three of them. The will was admitted to probate during her lifetime. Later, she decided to make a new will giving all her remaining properties only to the two girls, Safinia and Sophia. She then tore up the previously probated will. The second will was presented for probate only after her death. However, the probate court found the second will to be void for failure to comply with formal requirements. Letter A. Will the doctrine of dependent relative revocation apply? Suggested answer. No, the said doctrine will not apply. In the case of Molo v. Molo, GR number L-2538, September 21, 1951, the court stated that the doctrine of relative revocation is a rule where revocation of the old will is a suspensive condition or depends upon the efficacy of the new disposition and if the new will intended as a substitute is inoperative, 
the revocation fails and the original will remains in force. This was applied based on the fact that the original will appears to be lost. Hence, the second will was executed with a revocatory clause, but in both instances, the wife was instituted as the universal heir. In this case, however, the revocation of the original was not through the execution of a subsequent will with a revocatory clause, but through destruction with intent to do so. It does not appear either that the revocation of the old will operates as a suspensive condition to the efficacy of the subsequent will because the testator revoked the first original will as she does not wish to institute the same heirs, unlike in Molo versus Molo, where the wife was the heir in both wills. Alternative answer. Yes, because the act of destroying the previous will is connected with the making of the new will, raising a presumption that the testator meant the revocation of the previous will dependent upon the efficacy of the new will. This is the doctrine of dependent relative revocation. Here, the revocation is conditional and dependent upon the efficacy of the new will, since the new will, in this case, turns out to be void for failure of to comply with formal requirements, the previous will is not considered revoked. Tolentino, Civil Code of the Philippines, 1990, edition, page 145. Letter B. Will your answer be the same? If the second will was found to be valid but both Safinia and Sophia renounced their inheritance? Suggested answer. Yes, my answer will be the same. The doctrine of dependent relative revocation does not apply where the new will is rendered ineffective due to the renunciation of the heirs instituted therein. Renunciation has nothing to do with the validity of the will but only pertains to whether or not the heirs accept their share in the inheritance. Since the new will is still valid, the doctrine does not apply. Article 832 Civil Code Question. Sofronio was a married father of two when he had a brief fling with Sabrina, resulting in her pregnancy and the birth of their son Sinforoso. Though his wife knew nothing of the affair, Sofronio regretted it but secretly provided child support for Sinforoso. Unfortunately, when Sinforoso was 10 years old, Sofronio died. Only Sofronio's father, Salumbides, knew of Sabrina and Sinforoso. For the purpose of providing support to Sinforoso, Salumbides gave Sabrina usufructory rights over one of his properties, a house and lot, to last until Sinforoso reaches the age of majority. Sabrina was given possession of the property on the basis of caution horatoria. Two years later, after the creation of the usufra, the house accidentally burned down and three years thereafter, Sinforoso died before he could, before he could reach the age of 18. Will the usufra continue after the house has burned down? If yes, will it continue after Sinforoso's death? Suggested answer. Yes, the usufrac will continue after the house is burned. If the usufrac is constituted an immovable property of which a building forms part and the late latter should be destroyed in any manner whatsoever, the usufractory shall have a right to make use of the land and the materials. Article 607 Civil Code. The usufrac over the land and the materials continues. The thing was lost only in part. The right continues on the remaining parts. Article 604 Civil Code. No, it will be extinguished after Sinforoso's death. A usufrac granted for the time that may elapse before a third person attains a certain age shall subsist for the number of years specified even if the third person should die should die before the period expires unless such use of rack has been expressly granted only in consideration of the existence of such person or contrary intention clearly appears. Article 603-606 Civil Code. The circumstances given show that the use of rack was established by Salumbides in consideration of the existence of Sinforoso. It was meant for his support. Hence, his death extinguished the use of rack even though he died before reaching the age of majority. Question. 
newlywed Sam and Sheena had contracted with Sangria Hotel for their wedding reception. The couple was so unhappy with the service, claiming among other things that there was an unreasonable delay in the service of dinner and that certain items promised were unavailable. The hotel claims that while there was a delay in the service of the meals, the same was occasioned by the sudden increase of guests to 450 from the guaranteed expected number of 350 as stated in the banquet and meeting services contract. In the action for damages for breach of contract instituted by the couple, they claimed that the banquet and meeting services contract was a contract of adhesion since they only provided the number of guests and choose the menu. On the other hand, the hotel's defense was that the proximate cause of the complainant's injury was the unexpected increase in their guest, and this was what set the chain of events that resulted in the alleged inconveniences. Letter A. Does the doctrine of proximate cause apply in this case? Suggested answer. No, the doctrine does not apply. In the case of Spouses Guanyo versus Makati Shangri-La Hotel, GR number 190601, September 7, 2011, the doctrine of proximate cause is applicable only in actions for quasi-delicts, not in action involving breach of contract. The doctrine is a device for imputing liability to a person where there is no relation between him and another party where however there is a pre-existing contractual relation between the parties it is the parties themselves who make law between them here there is a contract the terms and conditions of such contract will govern the rights and obligations between the contracting parties in case of breach thereof not the doctrine of proximate cause letter b was the banquet and meeting services contract a contract of, of adhesion? If yes, is the contract void? Yes, it is a contract of adhesion, but the same is not void. A contract of adhesion is defined as one in which one of the parties imposes a ready-made form of contract which the other party may accept or reject, but which the latter cannot modify. Here, the contract is ready-made by Shangriya. As the spouses only choose the menu and provided the number of guests, but they cannot modify the terms thereof, hence a contract of addition. Although a contract of addition, it is not entirely against the law and is as binding as ordinary contracts, the reason being that the party who adheres to the contract is free to reject it entirely. But the effect as ruled in Orient Air versus CAGR number 76931, May 29, 1991, in, is that in case of ambiguity, it is construed against the party who caused it to be drafted and could have avoided it by the exercise of a little more care. Sinclair and Stiffy had an illicit relationship while Sinclair was married to another. The relationship produced a daughter, Sabina, who grew up with her mother. For most parts of Sabina's youth, Steffi spent for her support and education. When Sabina was 21 years old, Sinclair's wife of many years died. Sinclair and Steffi lost no time in legitimizing their relationship. After the 40-day prayers for Sinclair's late wife, Sinclair and Steffi got married without a marriage license, claiming that they have been cohabiting for the last 20 years. After graduating from college, Sabina decided to enroll in law school. Sinclair said that he was not willing to pay for her school fees since she was no longer a minor. Sinclair claimed that if Sabina wanted to be a lawyer, she had to work and spend for her law education. Letter A. What is Sabina's filiation status? Suggested answer. Sabina is an illegitimate child of Sinclair and Steffi because she was conceived and born outside a valid marriage. Article 165 Family Code. She was not legitimated by the subsequent marriage between Sinclair and Steffi. Only children conceived and born outside of wedlock of parents who, at the time of conception of the former, were not disqualified by any impediment to marry each other may be legitimated. 
Article 177 Family Code. At the time of Sabina's conception, her parents were disqualified by an impediment to marry each other because Sinclair was married to someone else. Letter B. Is Sinclair legally required to finance Sabina's law education? Suggested answer. Yes, he is legally required to finance Sabina's education. Support comprises everything indispensable for education, among other things, in keeping with the financial capacity of the family. The education of the person entitled to be supported shall include the schooling or training for some profession even beyond the age of majority. Article 194 Family Code Parents and their illegitimate children are obliged to support each other. Article 195 Family Code Considering the foregoing rules, St. Clair is enjoined by law to finance Sabrina's law education even beyond the age of majority. Question. Samantha sold all her business interests in a sole proprietorship to Sirio for the amount of 1 million pesos. Under the sale agreement, Samantha was supposed to pay for all prior unpaid utility bills incurred by the sole proprietorship. A month after the contract to sell was executed, Samantha still had not paid the 50,000 pesos electricity bills incurred during the sale. Since Sirio could not operate the business without electricity and the utility company refused to restore electricity services unless the, paid, the unpaid bills were settled in full, Sirio had to pay the unpaid electricity bills. When the date for payment arrived, Sirio only tendered 950,000 pesos representing the full purchase price less the amount he paid for the unpaid utility bills. Samantha refused to accept the tender on the ground that she was the one supposed to pay the bills and Sirio did not have authorization to pay on her behalf. Letter A. What is the effect of payment made by Sirio without the knowledge and consent of Samantha? Suggested answer. The payment by Sirio resulted in the extinguishment of the obligation of Samantha to the utility company and Sirio was legal or subrogated to the utility company's credit. Sirio thus became Samantha's new creditor. Under Article 1302, Paragraph 3, Civil Code, it is presumed that there is legal subrogation when, even without the knowledge of the debtor, a person interested in the fulfillment of the obligation pays without prejudice to the effects of confusion as to the latter share. A person interested in the fulfillment is one who will benefit from the extinguishment of the obligation. Here, Sirio is an interested person since he was the business successor in interest of Samantha and he cannot conduct his business without paying the debtor of Samantha. Since there is legal subrogation, Sirio stepped into the shoes of the utility company as the new creditor to the 50,000 pesos credit. Thus, there can be valid partially legal compensation of the two credits between him and Samantha who are principally debtors and creditors of each other up to the concurrent amount of 50,000 pesos. Article 1279, New Civil Code. Question. Letter B. Is Samantha guilty of mora accipiende? Suggested answer. Yes, Samantha is guilty of mora accipiende. The requisites for mora accipiende are 1. Offer of performance by the debtor. 2. Offer must be to comply with prestation as it should be performed. And 3. The creditor refuses to accept the performance without just cause. Here, Sirio validly made an offer to comply with the prestation of payment, albeit for 950,000 pesos only. Sirio's offer is justified based on on the concept of partial legal compensation up to the amount of 50,000 pesos since Sirio and Samantha are in their own right principal and debtor creditors of each other. Samantha's refusal was without just cause as she cannot be permitted to benefit or use as a defense her own failure to fulfill her part of the obligation to pay the electricity bills. Question. Saachie opened a savings bank account with Shanghainese Bank. He made an initial deposit of 100,000 pesos. 
part of the bank opening forms that he was required to sign to sign when he opened the account was a holdout agreement which provided that should he incur any liability or obligation to the bank, the bank shall have the right to immediately and automatically take over his savings account deposit. After he opened his deposit account, the Shanghainese bank discovered a scam wherein the funds in the account of another depositor in the bank was withdrawn by an impostor. Shanghainese bank suspected Saachi to be the impostor and filed a criminal case of Stafa against him. While the case was still pending with the prosecutor's office, the bank took over Saachi's savings deposit on the basis of the holdout agreement. What kind of contract is created when a depositor opens a deposit account with a bank? Suggested answer. A contract of simple loan is created when a depositor opens a deposit account with a bank. Fixed savings and current deposits of money and banks and similar institutions shall be governed by the provisions concerning simple loan, Article 1980 Civil Code. The creditor is the depositor while the debtor is the bank. Letter B. In this case, did the bank have the right to take over Saatchi's bank deposit? Suggested answer. No, the bank did not have the right to take over Saatchi's bank deposit. In the case of Metropolitan Bank and Trust Company versus Rosales, GR number 183204, January 13, 2014, it was held that the holdout clause, which is similar to the holdout agreement in the instant case, can be invoked only if there was a valid and existing obligation arising from any of the sources of obligation enumerated in Article 1157 of the Civil Code, to wit, law contracts, quasi-contracts, delic, and quasi-delic. The only possible source of obligation of Saatchi to Shanghainese Bank, based on the given facts, is delic. As the criminal case filed by the bank against Saatchi was still pending and no final judgment of conviction has been rendered, Saatchi had no valid and existing obligation to the bank. Thus, the bank had no right to take over the deposits of Saatchi. Question. Sunny Inc. SI purchased several heavy machineries from Single Equipment Philippines Incorporated SEP for 10 million pesos, payable in 36 monthly installments. A chattel mortgage was constituted on the same machineries as security for the amount. As additional security, the president of SI, Stan Smith, mortgaged his personal house and lot. SI failed to pay the 16th and succeeding monthly installments. SAP then commenced a collection suit against SI, and in the course of the proceedings, a writ of attachment was issued against SI properties, including mortgage machineries. The attached properties were subsequently sold at public auction, but the proceeds thereof were insufficient to satisfy the judgment credit. Letter A. Can SEP legally recover the deficiency? Suggested answer. Yes, SEP can legally recover the deficiency. The prohibition against further collection under Article 1484 of the Civil Code or Directo Law only applies if the seller chooses to foreclose the chattel mortgage and not when the seller opts to exact the fulfillment of the obligation. Tahan Langit v. Southern Motors, GR number 10789, May 28, 1957. SAP chose to exact the fulfillment of the obligation by commencing a collection suit against SI. SAP did not opt to foreclose the chattel mortgage over the equipment. The machineries were sold in an execution sale and in a foreclosure sale. Hence, the prohibition against further collection does not apply. Letter B. Instead of collecting the deficiency, can SAP commence extrajudicial proceedings to foreclose the mortgage on Stan's house and lot in order to recover the deficiency? Suggested answer. Yes, SEP can commence extrajudicial proceedings to foreclose the mortgage. SEP may choose to foreclose the mortgage on Stan's house and lot. 
What SEP is prohibited to do based on the case of Cruz versus Filipinas Investment and Finance Corporation, GR number LDAS 24772, May 27, 1968, is to extrajudicially foreclose the mortgage after it has extrajudicially foreclosed the chattel mortgage on the machineries sold on installment because if such is allowed, the protection given by Article 1484 would be indirectly subverted and public policy overturned. In this case, SEP has not foreclosed the chattel mortgage over the machineries. Alternative answer, no, because when SEP commenced the collection suit, it thereby waived its mortgage lien. Caltex Philippines Inc. v. IAC 176 is 741 1989. The remedies of an ordinary action to collect the debt and foreclosure of the real estate mortgage are alternative remedies and not cumulative. An election of one remedy operates as a waiver of the other. The mere act of filing a collection suit for the recovery of a debt secured by a mortgage constitutes waiver of the other remedy of foreclosure. Article 1484, Paragraph 3, Civil Code. Question. Socorro is the registered owner of Lot A while Segunda is the registered owner of the adjoining Lot B. Lot A is located at an elevated plateau of about 15 feet above the level of Lot B. Since Socorro was allegedly removing portions of the land and cement that supported the adjoining property, Segunda caused the annotation of an adverse claim against 50 square meter on Lot A's transfer certificate of title asserting the existence of a legal easement. Letter A. Does illegal easement in fact exist? If so, what kind? Suggested answer. Yes, illegal easement of lateral and subjacent support exists. According to Article 684 of the Civil Code, no proprietor shall make such excavation upon his land as to deprive any adjacent land or building of sufficient lateral or subjacent support. In the given case, an easement of lateral and subjacent support exists in the property of Socorro in favor of the property of Segunda. In the case of Castro v. Monson, GR No. 183719, February 2, 2011, in which the situation of the properties of the two landowners were similar to that in the given problem, the Supreme Court held that an easement existed in favor of the property of higher elevation because it was the owner of the said property which sued to have the easement recognized. Such finding, however, does not mean that no similar easement exists in favor of the property of lower elevation, since Article 684 does not make a distinction as to the elevation of the property. Letter B. If a legal easement does not exist, is an annotation of an adverse claim on the title of the Serbian state proper? Suggested answer. No, the annotation of an adverse claim over registered land under Article 70 of the, Civ of the Presidential Decree 1529 requires a claim on the title of the disputed land. Castro v. Munsud, 641 Iskra, 486 February to 2011. Segunda is not claiming ownership over the property of Socorro. She only wanted a judicial recognition of the existence of the easement. According to the Supreme Court on the cited case, an annotation of the existence of the lateral and subjacent support is no longer necessary because it exists whether or not it is annotated or registered in the property registry. A judicial recognition of the same already binds the property and the owner of the same, including his successors in interest. Alternative answer. No, it is not proper because an annotation of the existence of the lateral and subjacent support is no longer necessary. It exists whether or not it is annotated or registered in the registry of property. Although there is nothing which bars the annotation of an easement, not as an adverse claim, but as a real right. Simon owned a townhouse that he rented out to Shannon, a flight attendant with Soleil Philippine Airlines. They had no written contract but merely agreed on a three-year lease. 
Shannon had been using the townhouse as her base in Manila and had been paying rentals for more than a year when she accepted a better job offer from Sing Airlines. This meant that Singapore was going to be her new base and so she decided, without informing Simon, to sublease the townhouse to Sylvia, an office clerk in SPA. Letter A. Can Simon compel Shannon to reduce the lease agreement into writing? Suggested answer. Yes, Simon can compel Shannon to reduce the agreement into writing. While an agreement for the leasing of real property for a longer period than one year is covered by the statute of frauds, thus requiring a written memorandum of its essential provisions under Article 1403 Civil Code. According to Article 1406 of the Civil Code, the parties may only avail themselves of the right under Article 1357 of the Civil Code if the contract is enforceable under the Statute of Frauds. The contract was taken out of the operation of the Statute of Frauds under the doctrine of part performance. Under Article 1357 of the Civil Code, the contracting parties may compel each other to observe the form of contract required by law. Letter B. Does the sublease without Simon's knowledge and consent constitute a ground for terminating the lease? Suggested answer. No, it does not constitute a ground for terminating the lease. In the contract of lease of things, if there is no express prohibition, the lessee may sublet the thing leased, Article 1650 Civil Code. In this contract, there appears to be no prohibition regarding subleasing. Thus, there is no violation of the contract which can be used as a ground for terminating the contract. The act of a leasee in subleasing the thing without notifying the lessor list is not one of the causes for which the lessor may terminate the lease and judicially eject the lessee. Article 1673 Civil Code. Question. Selina was a single, 18-year-old when she got pregnant and gave birth to Suri. She then left to work as a caregiver in Canada, leaving Suri with her parents in the Philippines. Selina, now 34 years old and a permanent resident in Canada, met and married Sam, who is a 24-year-old Canadian citizen who works as a movie star in Canada. Sam's parents are of Filipino ancestry but had become Canadian citizens before Sam was born. Wanting Suri to have all the advantages of a legitimate child, Selena and Sam decided to adopt her. Sam's parents already opposed to the marriage of their son to someone significantly older, vehemently objected to the adoption. They argued that Sam was not old enough and that the requisite age gap required by the Inter-Country Adoption Act between Sam as adapter and Suri as adoptee was not met. Are Sam's parents correct? Suggested answer. No, Sam's parents are incorrect. Under Section 9 of Republic Act No. 8043 or the Inter-Country Adoption Act of 1995, the requirement that the adapter must be at least 27 Years of age and at least 16 years older than the adopted does not apply if the adopter is the spouse of the parent by nature of the adoptee. Since Sam is the spouse of Selina, who is the parent by nature of Suri, Sam may adopt Suri even if he is below 27 years of age and is not at least 16 years older than the adoptee. Note, the Inter-Country Adoption Act of 1995 requires that only a child who is below 15 years of age and is voluntarily or involuntarily committed to the Department of Social Work and Services may be adopted under inter-country adoption law. And the adopter must be at least 27 years of age and at least 16 years older than the child to be adopted at the time of the application unless the adopter is the natural parent of the child to be adopted or the spouse of such parents. Question. Sophia and Samuel, both unmarried, lived together for many years in the Philippines and begat three children. While Sophia stayed in the Philippines with the children, Samuel went abroad to work and became a naturalized German citizen. He met someone in Germany whom he wanted to marry. Samuel thereafter came home and filed a petition with the regional trial court. 
for partition of the common properties acquired during his union with Sophia and the Philippines. The properties acquired during the union consisted of a house and lot in Cavite worth 2 million pesos and some personal properties including cash and bank amounting to 1 million pesos. All these properties were acquired using similar salaries and wages since Sophia was a stay-at-home mother. In retaliation, Sophia filed an action on behalf of their minor children for support. Letter A. How should the properties be partitioned? Suggested answer. The property should be divided equally between Sophia and Samuel. The property relations of Sophia and Samuel is governed by Article 147 of the Civil Code because they lived exclusively with each other as husband and wife and they were capacitated to marry each other. Under the said provisions, the wages and salaries of Sophia and Samuel shall be owned by them in equal shares. Hence, the cash in the bank from Samuel's salary and wages is co-owned by Samuel and Sophia in equal shares. Article 147 also provides that the property acquired by the parties through their work or industry shall be governed by the rules on co-ownership and in the absence of proof to the contrary, properties acquired during the cohabitation shall be presumed to have been obtained by their joint efforts, work, or industry and shall be owned by them in equal shares. Article 147 provides further that if the efforts of one of the parties consistent in the care and maintenance of the family and of the household, he or she is deemed to have contributed jointly in the acquisition of the property, even if he or she did not participate in the acquisition of the other party of the said property. Sophia, as a stay-at-home mother, cared for and maintained the family. Consequently, she is deemed to have contributed in the acquisition of the house and lot. As co-owner, Sophia is entitled to one half of the property. Letter B. Should Samuel be required to support the minor children? Suggested answer. Yes, Samuel should be required to support the minor children. Parents and their illegitimate children are obliged to support each other. Article 195 Family Code. Samuel is required to support his illegitimate children with Sophia. The children are illegitimate because they were conceived and born outside a valid marriage. Article 165 Family Code. Another answer. Even if the new national law of Samuel does not oblige him to support his minor illegitimate children in the Philippines, the said foreign law cannot be applied in the Philippines for two reasons. The Philippines may refuse to apply said foreign law because it is contrary to a sound and established policy of the forum. And number two, the Philippine laws which have for their object public policy cannot be rendered ineffective by a foreign law. Article 17, Paragraph 3, NCC, Del Socorro v. Van Vels, Wilson, 744, Iskra, 516214. Question. Shasha purchased an airline ticket with Sea Airlines covering Manila, Bangkok, Hanoi, Manila. The ticket was exclusively endorsable to Siam Airlines. The contract of air transportation was between Shasha and SEL with the latter endorsing to SMA the Hanoi Manila segment of the journey. All her flights were confirmed by SAL before she left Manila. Sasha took the flight from Manila to Bangkok on board SAL using the ticket. When she arrived in Bangkok, she went to the SAL ticket counter and confirmed her return trip from Hanoi to Manila on board SMA flight to S number SA888. On the date of her return trip, she checked in for SMA flight number SA888, boarded the plane, and before she could even settle in on her assigned seat, she was offloaded and treated rudely by the crew. She lost her luggage and missed an important business meeting. She thereafter filed a complaint solely against SAL and argued that it was solidarily liable with SMA for the damages she, she suffered since the latter was only an agent of the former. Should either or both SAL and SMA be held liable for damages that Sasha suffered? Suggested answer. Only SAL should be held liable for damages. This case has the same factual milieu with that of China Airlines versus Daniel Shock, 
GR number 152122, July 30, 2003, where the court cited British Airways versus Court of Appeals, GR number 121824, January 29, 1998, ruling that as the principal in the contract of carriage, the petitioner was held liable even when the breach of contract has occurred, not on its own but on that of another airline. It is also cited Lufthansa German Airlines v. Court of Appeals, GR number 83612, November 24, 1994, in which the court held that the obligation of the ticket issuing airline remained and did not cease, regardless of the fact that another airline had undertaken to carry the passengers to one of their destinations. In this case, since the contract of air transportation is between Shasha and SAL, the latter as principal remains liable as the principal despite the fact that the breach occurred in SMA. SMA cannot be held liable in this case because the court has no jurisdiction over it. It is imperative and in accordance with due process and fair play that SMA should have been impleted as a party in the present proceedings before the, this court can make a final ruling on this matter. Alternative answer. SAL and SMA may be held solidarily liable to Sasha. SAL is liable to Sasha for breach of the contract of carriage because it failed to bring Sasha to the latter's destination as agreed upon in the contract. Sam, on the other hand, is liable to Sasha for tort under the provision of Article 2176 in relation to Article 2180 of the Civil Code. While Sam is an independent contractor and that an agent of SAL, both Sal and Sam are solidarily liable to Sasha because a contractual obligation can be breached by tort and when the same act or omission causes the injury, one resulting in culpa contractual and the other in culpa aquiliana, Article 2194 of the Civil Code can well apply. In addition, a liability for tort may arise even under a contract where tort is that which breaches the contract. It's stated differently when an act which constitutes a breach of contract would have itself constituted the source of a quasi-delectual liability had no contract existed between the parties, the contract can be said to have been breached by tort, thereby allowing the rules on tort to apply. LRTA versus Navidad, GR number 145804, February 6, 2003. Another alternative answer, SAL and SMA are jointly liable. In KLM versus CA, GR number L-31150, July 22, 1915, the Supreme Court held that the ticket issuing carrier assumes full responsibility for the entire trip and shall be held accountable for the breach of guarantee. Damages may also be exacted from SMA because their acts fall under quasi delict Another suggested alternative answer, only SMA is liable. Under the Warsaw Convention, the ticket issuing airlines subcontracts the contract of carriage to other airlines as in this instance, there is no agency created and the subsequent carrier is liable for the damage it has incurred. Letter B. Assuming that one is an agent of the other is the agency coupled with interest suggested answer yes the agency was constituted as a means of fulfilling an obligation which had already been contracted and also a bilateral contract depends upon the agency article 1927 civil code in the case of felix mining versus cir gr number 148187 April 16, 2008, the court defined an agency coupled with an interest as one that cannot be revoked or withdraw by the principal due to an interest of a third party that depends upon it or the mutual interest of both principal and agent. Here, since the ticket is exclusively endorsable to the agent, some then it has a mutual interest with the principal sal in the fulfillment of the obligation. Question. Sebastian, who has a pending assessment from the Bureau of Internal Revenue, was required to post a bond. He entered into an agreement with Solid Surety Company, SSC, for SEC to issue a bond in favor of the BIR to secure payment of his taxes if found to be due. In consideration of the issuance of the bond, he executed an indemnity agreement with SSC 
whereby he agreed to indemnify the latter in the event that he was found liable to pay the tax. The BIR eventually decided against Sebastian and judicially commenced action against both Sebastian Chan and SSC to recover Sebastian's unpaid taxes. Simultaneously, BIR also initiated action to foreclose on the ban. Even before paying the BIR, SSC bought indemnity for, sought indemnity from Sebastian on the basis of the indemnity agreement. Sebastian refused to pay since SSC had not paid the BIR anything yet and alleged that the provision in the indemnity agreement which allowed SSC to recover from him by mere demand even if it SSC had not yet paid the creditor was void for being contrary to law and public policy. Can Sebastian refuse to pay SSC? Suggested answer. No, Sebastian cannot legally refuse to pay. A stipulation in an indemnity agreement providing that the indemnitor shall pay the surety as soon as the latter becomes liable to make payment to the creditor under the terms of the bond, regardless of whether the surety was made payment actually or not, is valid and enforceable. In accordance therewith, the surety may demand from the indemnitor even before the creditor has paid. Security Bank and Trust Company Inc. v. Globe Assurance Company Inc. 58OG3708-1962. Under the terms of the contract, Sebastian's obligation to indemnify became due and demandable from the moment he has incurred liability and that from the moment of payment. Question. Simon was returning to Manila after spending a weekend from his parents in Sariaya, Quezon. He boarded a bus operated by the Sabit bus line on August 30, 2013. In the middle of the journey, the bus collided with truck coming from the opposite direction, which was overtaking the vehicle in front of the truck. Though the driver of the SBL bus tried to avoid the truck, a mishap occurred as the truck hit the left side of the bus. As a result of the accident, Simon suffered a fractured leg and was unable to, to report for work for one week. He sued SBL for actual and moral damages. SBL raised the defense that it was the driver of the truck who was at fault and that it exercised the diligence of a good father of a family in the selection and supervision of its driver. S SSBL Liable for actual damages, for moral damages, suggested answer. It depends on what the source of obligation the action is based. If based on contract, SBL will be liable for actual damages but not moral damages. As a common carrier, SBL is required to observe extraordinary diligence and the law expressly provides that its liability does not cease upon proof that it exercised the diligence of a good father of a family in selecting and supervising its drivers. It is not liable, however, for moral damages as Article 2220 requires it to have acted fraudulently or in bad faith, which is not provided by the facts. If the action, however, is anchored under quasi delict SBL will be liable for actual and moral damages. As a common carrier, it is required to exercise extraordinary diligence. Moral damages also may be awarded under Article 2219 if the plaintiff suffered physical injuries as a result of a quasi-delectual act. Alternative answer. If a contract of carriage, the carrier is required to exercise extraordinary diligence and is liable whenever a passenger suffers injury before he breaches his, before he reaches his destination in an action to recover damages arising from breach of contract of carriage the passenger needs only to prove the existence of the contract and the failure of the carrier to safely bring him to his destination moral damages may not however be recovered from the carrier unless the passenger dies or the carrier is guilty of bad faith or gross negligence. Neither applies in this case. Estrada v. Philippine Rabbit Bus Company, GR number 203902, July 19, 2017. Will SBL be liable to pay interest if it is required to pay damages and delays in the payment of the judgment award? What is the rate of interest and from when should the interest start running? 
Suggested answer, yes, SBL will be liable to pay interest at the rate of 6% from the finality of the judgment until satisfaction. According to the case of Nakar v. Gallery Frames, GR No. 189871, August 13, 2013, when the judgment of the court awarding a sum of money becomes final and executory, the rate of legal interest shall be 6% per annum from such finality until its satisfaction.